Well, good morning, Faith Fellowship. It is so good to be with you all today. Good morning to those of you joining us online. Thank you for being here. It is always such a privilege to be in the house of God and to worship together. No matter how far apart we may be physically, we are united in the Spirit, in purpose, plan, and action, just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is so beautiful, a prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples in John 17. Let they let them be one in the same way that you, Father, and I are one. We're continuing a series, and I have the privilege of, of stepping into this particular uh, topic as Pastor Letty has been leading us through this. Um, what, what an awesome series this is. It reminds me of David's prayer where he said, Lord, search me and see if there is any offensive way within me. And we know from the book of Jeremiah that the human heart is deceitful and who can know it? It's a, it's a frightening thing to just go through life without considering the deception of our own heart. And um, we've, had, we've had messages on that. We've had message on lying tongue, message on deception um, last week. And, and so we're just continuing in that, same, uh, in that same line of thinking on the next detestable sin. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community." Pray with me as we get started this morning and just just ask the Lord to to reveal to us whatever it is that he wants to show us today. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given. The incredible blessing of being in your house. God, we come before you in prayer. We come before you, we lift up your praises. We come before you and submit ourselves to your word and to your teaching, God. I pray that you would be glorified and honored this morning. As we look at this, just this one little phrase from this passage of scripture and and all of the depth that you have for us within, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, hands that shed innocent blood. I guess the first thing that we have to look at here is what is innocent blood blood. There is a difference, and many people don't, don't realize, between killing and murder. There is a difference between killing and murder. In fact, when you, when you read um, in the book of Exodus, you read the Ten Commandments, right? And, and most translations will say, you shall not murder or thou shalt not murder. If your translation says, thou shalt not kill, that's probably a poor, transa- a poor translation. Because the truth is that Even God kills people. We know this all throughout scripture. Obviously, the flood is a fantastic example. God commanded Israel to go and to wipe out entire nations, certainly to kill individuals at times. Um, God was about to destroy Nineveh, uh, before he stepped in in his, in his mercy and grace because of their repentance, extreme repentance. Um, God annihilated Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, we know at the end of time, he is going to destroy the wicked, save for the tribulation and everything that's happening before that. So we know that God sheds blood. And of course, we would be remiss to, to skip over the fact that he shed his own blood for us and to give us the, the opportunity to turn to him in repentance and to once again become part of his kingdom, pure and blameless, spotless before him because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So he doesn't just shed others' blood. He's willing to shed his own innocent blood. But God detests hands that shed innocent blood. The difference between killing and murder, killing is um, taking the life of another person Um, murder is unlawfully taking the life of another person. So what does it really come down to? It really comes down to the law. What is a justified killing versus what is unjustified 
killing. So that is the big, the big difference that we have to remember. There are many occasions to where the law justifies the taking of human life. Um, God even said, an eye for an eye, a life for a life, a bruise for a bruise, a wound for a wound. In God's system, there is justice. In fact, the reason why Jesus had to die is because there's a, there's a requirement of death for sin. So in fact, we all, deserve, we all deserve death spiritually, but what this is talking about is the law that we have here on earth. Right, so there are times, obviously, we know when God, God instituted the death penalty. That was his original institution, and we have reflections of those kinds of things here on earth. So why does God hate hands that shed innocent blood? Why does God hate unjustified killing? We got to go back to the beginning, Genesis 1, 27. God created mankind in his own image. Now, he could have stopped there. But he repeated it again. And in, in the syntax and the language of Hebrew, like this is, a, this is a heavy emphasis. So he says the same thing again. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, and it says again, he created them. Why does it say it so many times? Well, it's saying it so that we can understand the importance, the inflection, the, the emphasis of this statement that human beings are not just another creation. We are created in the image of God. We bear the likeness of God, and it is God who created us. Check this out in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. Have you ever thought about that word? I know you've read it, right? We know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Like, we know that. It's part of, like, the, the salvation track, right, that you lead people through to, like, understand the nature of, of salvation. But the verse right after that, why did God give us this, this undeserved gift of salvation? Because we're his masterpiece, and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good works that he planned for us long ago. So we can step into the calling, step into the plan, step into the joy that he has for us in serving him in his kingdom because we are his masterpiece of all creation. Like we are his Mona Lisa. We are his Sistine Chapel. You know, like we are Beethoven's fifth. Like we are the 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 most beautiful and amazing work that he has poured himself in. He's poured his very image into us. Absolutely incredible. Psalm 139, you know this passage. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together. Have you ever watched someone sit and actually knit? Like how they're just crafting with their hands. It's not like a distant thing. And, and, and one by one, they're, they're knitting this yarn together. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So the value of human life, this is what God is, is, is pushing here in this, in this, uh, this particular detestable sin about the taking of, of innocent blood. God is saying, I value human life. So to disregard human life so casually as to shed innocent blood is to disregard the image of God. God tells us, he says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he says, today I have given you a choice. And I want you to remember this as we're looking at this message today. It may, in fact, go a little deeper than you, you may realize or think of right off the bat. Today have you, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make is you know that your life is a testimony. It's a testimony. You are, you are a testament to the power of God, the blood of Christ, the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, moving through you, moving you to repentance. When you choose life, you are testifying to all of creation of the power of God. Incredible. So heaven and earth is witnessing this choice Oh, that you would choose life 
so that you and your descendants might live. The longing, the pleading of God for his people. All right, so we're going to look at three points today. Three ways that we shed innocent blood. Uh, The first one, probably um, the most recognizable and obvious. We shed innocent blood physically with our hands. Now, this is what God's talking about right off the bat. It's very apparent um, on its face, on the surface, hands that shed innocent blood. When we, when we physically harm someone else to take their life. Uh, this obviously happened all throughout the Bible. We see many examples of, of murder, the unjustified killing, um, the taking of innocent blood. One of the examples that really stands out to me so clearly comes from 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 6 through 23. And for the sake of time today, I'm not going to read this entire passage, but I'll sum it up for you. Saul has been uh, chasing David. David's been anointed king. Um, Saul probably knows this at this point. And, and the people, they say, you know, Saul has slain his, his thousands and David has slain his tens of thousands. And the people, there's just a movement where they want David to be king. And Saul has allowed jealousy um, and anger to creep into his heart. He's, he's defensive of what he sees to be his kingdom rather than the Lord's kingdom. And it's so sad because, you know, Saul could have, I mean, what, what would it have been like if Saul would have embraced David? If he would have embraced the fact that God had anointed David king, and that doesn't mean right away that Saul wasn't going to be king anymore. I mean, David's path, you know, was set was set by the Lord, but Saul could have remained king for a while and eventually, and, and with honor, he could have passed the torch, passed the crown to David. And, and then his son, Jonathan, could have been with David for who knows how many years. Who knows if Jonathan's influence could have helped David in the time when, when he committed adultery and murder uh, with Bathsheba and against Uriah. Uh, who knows what that, what that could have looked like, but Saul didn't allow any of that to take place the way that the Lord would have wanted it to. You know, it says, oh, that you would choose life, God pleading, God longing. And that's what he's always doing, you know, with us and in our hearts. And this is a really important facet to remember all through this series of seven, you know, six things God hates, seven that he despises. Like the detestable sins are not about, hey, let's just look at, you know, these things that God hates and and look at how they don't really apply to us, but they apply to like everyone else and to the world and non-believers. But like, let's sit and ask God to sift our hearts and to prune us the same way that this ice storm has just just come through the state of Texas. It has pruned all of the trees. In fact, a lot of um, people who are who are in kind of the realm of, of ecology, they say this is one of the best things that has actually happened to our state because all of that ice pruned the trees. They took off all of these branches, which were really unnecessary for the trees. They're soaking up extra nutrients, doing all these things. And the truth is that it, it was a pruning that took place. It's better for the soil. It's better for the environment. So it's, it's really interesting the, the concept of pruning, but Saul did not allow himself to be pruned. And so when we get to this passage in 1 Samuel 22, uh, David has just come through the area and um, these, these priests helped him and assisted him and gave him resources and gave him, um, gave him housing, you know, as he was moving through. And Saul came in, he heard about this. And what he decided to do out of anger, out of vengeance, out of jealousy, um, void of the Holy Spirit, decided to kill Ahimelech and his entire family and the entire family of his, his father's house who was living there. And then also the 85 priests who were in the area and all because he burned with jealousy and anger for David. This is the shedding of innocent blood with our hands. But you know, the truth is, it doesn't start there. It never starts there. You know, we look at that and we say, oh, wow, I would, I would never do something like that. I would, I would never take someone's life. I would never shed innocent blood. 
but it did not start there for Saul. You know, it starts actually with our words. Before the shedding of innocent blood takes place physically, it takes place with our words. And look what God says about this in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. This is interesting because really you think that our hands have the power of life and death. Like we can, like we could bludgeon someone or we could, we could take a gun and, and we could go and, and murder a bunch of people as we see in the news from time to time. We could, you know, use our hands to, to drive a car while we're under the influence of, of alcohol or some other substance and, and take someone's life. Uh, but the truth is, the power of life and death also resides in the tongue. We tend to be very loose with our tongues. We don't think of them with the same weight and the same gravity as we think of our hands. But God says that the power of life and death lies within the tongue. Look at another proverb, chapter 12, verse 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I know um, in my life, the Lord has taken me on such a journey. I call it the journey of gentleness. <laughs> and I've learned in my life that gentleness is an incredible weapon, a tool in your belt um, as a leader. You know, as, as you look to lead other people, lead, lead a family, lead friends, lead coworkers, whatever that leadership facet looks like for you, because the truth is we're all leading we're all leading all the time by our actions. The question is, to where are we leading people? The question is not whether you're leading or not. The question is, where are you leading people to? And um, as I realized this, I realized that gentleness is an incredible uh, tool for the leader. It's, it's disarming. Um, it, it helps people to feel security in their relationship with you and in the, their, their status, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and it, it casts away insecurities and it makes you very approachable. And so you begin to make investments. You know, I uh, heard a good friend of mine say yesterday as we were sitting talking, he said, five investments for every one withdrawal. You want to make five investments into somebody for every one time that you make an ask of them. And this is actually a really powerful sales technique as well. Um, but it's the same principle for the kingdom, the, the power of gentleness. So I've been on this journey of gentleness, and I have learned that um, words can be so destructive. They can be so, so reckless. And I used to speak uh, just so quickly, and I would, I would weaponize my intellect against other people. I would do this with religion, with things like the Sabbath or the end times. And, and to me, these weren't exciting truths to share, which revealed the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ and his love. They were weapons that I could use to show how I knew more than other people, how I was closer to God because of what I knew and, and because of these things. And ironically, that only revealed that I was actually, even with all of this truth, further from God than someone who, who wasn't using the, the truths in that way. So, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. This is why Jesus was, if you could say that Jesus was ever harsh, right? Because the Bible says gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. Let your gentleness be evident to all. This was a journey for me in learning this. And, and I, I know by God's grace that I am an, an entirely different person than I was a few years ago in this regard. 100% glory and, and honor to the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ for that transformation. Nothing to do with myself. But before this journey of gentleness took place, I was a lot like the Pharisees. And if Jesus was ever harsh, right? Like if he was ever, you know, not gentle, it was for good reason. It was for righteous indignation, not for his own pride, his own arrogance. It was for zeal for the Father and for his house. And so if he was ever harsh, if you could describe it that way, it was with the religious community. 
It wasn't with the world, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the people who, who were, you know, desperate and, and fallen in, in the darkness of sin and who were looking for a savior. It was for the Pharisees who thought that they could use and weaponize the law of God and take God's name in vain by, by wearing, by bearing his name and by, by having no reflection of the love that is at the core of his law. And that is why they missed Jesus. When he came, not only did they not recognize him, they hated him. They murdered him. They shed the most innocent. It was their hands that shed the most innocent of blood. Yet they knew the law better than anyone. All 613 laws of Moses. They knew them and followed them. And Jesus knew that. And he said, you follow the law. So, so you know, do what the Pharisees are telling you to do. Do what they say, but do not copy their example because they don't know me. And he called them a brood of vipers and all these things. So if there was a place where Jesus spoke out in this way, it was against the harshness of religion. And it was against reckless words that pierced like swords. And Jesus came, he was called the balm of Gilead. The tongues of the wise bring healing. Another verse in Colossians 4, let your conversation be always, I'm sorry, what? Be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let your conversation be always full of grace. That would be an awesome verse to internalize, memorize, put in your back pocket and measure every word that comes out of your mouth against Colossians 4, 6. As I was saying a moment ago, this is how Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. He said, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment. Embrace yourself. For every empty word they have spoken. Some translations read every careless word. It's the same as what we were just looking at in Proverbs. Um, reckless words. So, <laughs> there's so much here. But what I want to look at in particular is that from the heart, the mouth speaks. So he said it doesn't just start with the hands. It starts before that with the words. But the truth is, the shedding of innocent blood doesn't start with words either. It starts, number three, with our hearts. It starts with our hearts. Jesus spoke to this, um, but so did John. He said, anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life within them. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. And so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Powerful verse, and, and we look at Jesus' words as well. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder and so this is what we're looking at as well, hands that shed innocent blood, right? It's like, that's what we're told. That's the only phrase that we have in this passage. That's what they had as well. And Jesus expounds upon that. And he says, if you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, love when Jesus does that. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus says, if, you're, if you even harbor anger in your heart, then you are in danger of judgment. In the same way he talks about lust. If anyone even lusts after a woman, he's already committed adultery. It's the same kind of thing he's saying here. If you even allow the spirit of anger to creep in, it's like it's as if you have already murdered that person. Now, why does Jesus say that? Because he knows that the inward spirit leads to outward action. The inward spirit leads to outward action. 
When you allow anger, which is really just a product, an emotion that's a product of bitterness, of unforgiveness, of offense, which really these three things are just a product of something else, pride, then you're allowing this root to sit in really deep. So if you struggle with any of these things that I've just mentioned, I want you to consider something. You know, you feel like you're just pruning. It's like, ah, I get angry and I, I prune it back. And I, I get, I, I have unforgiveness and, and I gotta, I gotta, you know, just prune that back. And, and I have bitterness and I just gotta, I just gotta not, you know, dwell on that and not let it, not let it show. <laughs> what you're doing is trimming like the little leaves off of a, a weed but never getting to the root. At the first house where Lex and I lived, um, there were these big, thorny, nasty bushes. And uh, I, I'm not, I don't even know what kind of, <laughs> what kind of plant they were, um, but I know that they, they grew really fast. And by the time we lived there, such a, such a short time later, it seemed, they were so big and so bushy and like growing up into the edge of the house. And so I went in there with an axe and I chopped it down, down to its, you know, stub right there at the bottom. And don't you know, it wasn't but a few weeks later and those things were growing back. And I mean growing back with a vengeance in full force, just sprouting new limbs that they didn't even have before. It seemed like the, the thorns were bigger and, the, and longer and more vicious, and it was growing faster than it ever had before. <laughs> Why did that happen? Because I never addressed the root of that weed. I think a lot of times in our lives, it's like our, our life is this beautiful garden that the Lord has crafted. And when we don't attend to it, we end up with these deep rooted weeds that are very difficult to manage and very difficult to pluck out. And so we have to go into the garden with like just this full force, like we've got to get our gloves on and, and we've got to prepare ourselves and, and it takes all day and we've got to start weeding that garden to protect the beauty of, of the plants that are, have been intentionally placed there or else the weeds will overrun and kill everything that we want to be there and then the, our garden will be full of only things that we don't even, that we don't even want to be there. But when we're willing to attend to that garden each and every day, when we see a tiny little something and we pluck it out before the root sets in deep, we don't have to put on gloves. We don't have to get down and dirty. We don't have to set aside an entire day to deal with it. We just say, oh, what's that? We take five seconds to bend down and to pluck it out and to throw it away then no, nothing ever plants deep roots in our... Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is where we want to be with the Lord. This is exactly you know, what, we, what we want to do in our Christian walk. Not go to church, not sing songs, you know, just karaoke songs, not say our prayer, you know, get up in the morning, I do my, I do my devotional, I say my prayers before my meals, like not the rituals. Those things all have beauty, they all have meaning, they all, they all have worth, but only, only if they are spurred on by a heart that desires the righteousness of God. Does the book of 1 Peter not say that heaven will be a kingdom filled with the righteousness of God? So if we don't value his righteousness now, if it's not worth attending to that garden now, if we're negligent and complacent and apathetic in our walk with him, religion will creep in faster than you can possibly imagine and plant roots down so deep that it will take work. And I mean real work to root out. And eventually, sometimes what happens is, ah, it's just not worth dealing with. And this is where Saul, the place that Saul got to, 
where he eventually became void of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just happen in one day. We are all in danger because we love the Lord with all our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. And then that means that we love his law because his law reveals who he is. And so we love his law because of that. And what's the biggest danger to number one? Number two, this is what happened to the Pharisees. I don't think that Israel started out being obsessed with the law. I think that they love God. I think that they loved God. But eventually something happened and they began to substitute information about God. Things like the Sabbath, things like the prophecies. Boy, if that doesn't hit home. Things like going to the temple services. Things like what they were wearing on certain days. Things like when and how long they were fasting. (laughs) Things like the kind of songs and chants that they would sing. These things began to replace a relationship with and a walk with the Lord. And the symptom, the evidence of that was that love and grace and compassion were things that became foreign to them and eventually they were, they were void of those things. And so for us, I don't want us to enter into a series like this, press into a series like this, come to church like this, watch online like this, and get a lot of really good points, you know, to write down in a notebook and remain unchanged. I don't want us to be snipping away at the, at the leaves and branches of these dangerous weeds that have roots down deep in our heart and never address the root and think that we've done some kind of service to God. If you're dealing with anger in your heart, which God says is equivalent to murder, if you're dealing with that, then it's probably, there's probably something deeper. It's not the anger that's your problem. It's probably the bitterness, the unforgiveness. It's probably something like that. And and the bitterness and the unforgiveness isn't the root either. You've gone from like leaf to branch, and now you've got to find the root. The root of bitterness and unforgiveness is pride. How could they do how could they do that to me? It doesn't matter at what level, whether it's someone cut you off in traffic. Now, how dare someone in traffic cut me off? I understand. I used to be in this place, and from time to time I'm still there. I'm a work in progress. But I've begun to realize that the way that I see myself is usually the core of the problems that I'm facing. Whether it's fear, anxiety, anger, many of these things, is the way that I see myself is the core of the problem. So someone cuts me off in traffic, how dare they do that to me? This is my road. I was driving here first. (laughs) Or whether it's something deeper, it's kind of a silly example, but something that some of us deal with. Maybe it's deeper. How could they say those things about me? Don't they know who I am? Don't they know what I've done for them? After all that I've done, how could they treat me like that? As if we deserve anything other than death. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, we deserve death. And the one who deserved everything, Jesus Christ, was tormented and persecuted and tortured and murdered and rejected and despised. Comes down to the root of pride. It doesn't matter if someone stole from you. It doesn't matter if someone spoke negatively about you. It doesn't matter if someone degraded you or manipulated you or betrayed you. Jesus knew all of these things and what did he do? He washed the disciples' feet. He washed the feet of Judas, knowing exactly what was coming. That is the nature, the humility of Christ. And we are called to be like him. And you know what? You have the mind of Christ, the Bible says. The same power, Scripture says, that raised Jesus from the grave lives within you. So it is not too far, not with the power of the Holy Spirit, 
There's no need for us to sit in this place of anger, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, all rooted in the place of pride. If you allow Jesus, he can help you to root out that pride in your life so that you can reflect his glory. No story is more... (laughs) apt, I think, in this moment than the story of Cain and Abel. Cain did not just one day murder his brother. He did not just one day shed innocent blood. It did not happen like that. The Bible even says that Cain allowed his heart to be darkened. The Bible says that sin was crouching at his doorstep. He had an opportunity to master it, but instead he chose to be mastered by it And he became a slave to his sin. And so his life was turned upside down because of his sin. And as he allowed that anger to set down deep within his heart, that internal, you know, feeling, that internal voice that he allowed to take root produced outward action. And that action manifested as murder, murdering his own brother. So what can you take away this morning? This is it right here. Guard your heart. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Do you invest time, brother, sister, guarding your heart? I built, a, I built a fence around the house where Lex and I used to live, and it was hard work. It took time, it took money, it took all of these things. An inordinate amount of effort, especially if you live in central Texas. Boy, the ground here is unforgiving. <laughs> it is unforgiving. So much rock, and it's just, it's work to, to dig those posts and to set them in concrete and to build a fence, a big old fence. Why? To protect your house. You have security system. You have locks on your door. People, you know, they, they, they go through effort to guard things that matter to them. So I guess the question is, do we value our hearts? And you could say yes or no, but the truth is that Our actions reveal what we really think, what we really value. You want to know what someone values? Look how they spend their money. Look how they spend their time. Do you spend money and time guarding your heart? Or are you just kind of letting the garden go? Because eventually you will end up with a debilitating and dangerous problem. We've got to learn to actively guard our hearts because the course of your life is determined by your heart. What are you letting in? What is coming out? The overflow of the heart. The mouth speaks. Posture over position. Posture over position is what I want to leave you with today. Our heart posture is far more important than the positions that we obtain. The position in our family, the position in our job, the positions in our finances, the positions in a community, the positions in the room, whatever it might be, our heart posture is far more important. And to Jesus, the person scrubbing the toilet with humility in the mind of Christ and the love of Christ is far greater in the kingdom than the person standing on the platform bloated with pride. Dwight Moody said, I'd rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. The posture of the heart, more important than the position that we obtain because the truth is in the kingdom, left is right, right is left, down is up, up is down. In the kingdom, everything's backwards. And in the kingdom, the person with the highest position is the person with the humblest posture. The tallest giant is the one on their knees in prayer. So when it comes to the shedding of innocent blood, hands that shed innocent blood, realize that it is the protecting of the heart 
the guarding of the heart that protects the overflow <laughs> the, of what the mouth is speaking. The guarding of the heart keeps you from speaking recklessly and, and divisively. And not speaking that way. So the heart's protecting the words and the words are protecting the actions. And so we never end up in the place where our hands are shedding innocent blood. Why? Because all the way back to the beginning, we're guarding our hearts. 